So, like I said, we're talking about UK data transfers um, today. I will answer any questions at the end of the session. So if you want to type them, I will review the questions uh, when we get to the session or the section near the end. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Kelly Peters. I'm a founder of Data Basics um, and we run these uh, webinars once a month on the last Friday at the month as a lunch and learn. Um, and this is um, a rather popular one. So thank you um, for joining me. So I'm going to cover some basics first. So a restricted transfer for anyone that is unfamiliar um, with this is under the UK GDPR, it restricts transfer of personal data. That's name, email, address, um, biometric information, health data, anything that identifies you and me. Uh, to a separate organisation located outside of the UK um, unless the rights of the individuals in uh, respect to their personal data is protected in another way uh, or one of a limited number of um, exceptions apply and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about what allows us to transfer data from the UK talking about the new international data transfer agreement that the uh, UK ICO um, has now had approved and as well as the addendum to the EU um, standard contract clauses. So what I would like to say first is if you are an international company and you happen to have branches in international um, uh, countries, obviously, if you live in the UK, um, transfers inter-company, inter so your office here in the UK to your, your office in the US or your office in um, Australia um, is not classed as a restricted transfer under the UK um, GDPR. So one of the ways um, that you can transfer data where you will not need to have an international data transfer agreement is where there is an adequacy regulation. So those of you that are familiar with EU GDPR, you'll know of adequacy decisions. Here in our version of the GDPR, we talk about them as UK adequacy regulations. Now we have adopted all of the UK, so all of the EU, um, adequacy decisions so data from the UK to the European economic area or to um, territories covered by adequacy decisions already this is the likes of Japan partial agreement with Canada uh, transfers to Australia for example are permitted so you can continue to do that data transfer as is always the case and you do not need to have a data transfer agreement so First thing to think about is when you're looking at your data transfers, where is the data being transferred to? Um, which country is importing the data? If it's one of these or on this first slide, you're covered by an adequacy regulation and you'll want to make sure that your privacy policies reflect that fact. Now, what the regulation also talks about is if you're not relying on a adequacy regulation, you need to make sure that there are appropriate safeguards in place to allow you to transfer that data outside of the UK. So if you are a large global organisation, you could rely on uh, binding corporate rules you could have standard contract clauses, which is the common way in which data has always been transferred if we didn't have an adequacy uh, decision. Um, or there are clauses that are specific to you being a, a public authority. So what I'm going to focus on is the appropriate um, safeguard and what the UK has actually now put in place and has approved as of this week. So the International Data Transfer um, Agreement went out to consultation last year. It was set before Parliament in January. Um, there were no um, challenges to that. So what we now have is um, two options available to us where we are not transferring data under an adequacy decision. We can use the International Transfer Agreement or we can use the addendum to the EU standard contract clauses, and I'm going to cover the latter um, later on in the slide deck. 
So what the um, International Data Transfer Agreement allows us to do is to be able to put contractual conditions in place between us and the um, it data importer, the company vendor in the non-UK EU um, EEA country, um, so that it has the equivalent level of protection as we expect under the UK GDPR. And I'm going to talk about what you need to do before you get to this stage. So what the Information Commissioner has produced is a risk assessment. So this is referred to as the transfer risk assessment. So this is the first stage. So you should be considering the risks that are associated with your data transfer. I'm assuming that you all know where your data is being transferred to and you've done all your data mapping. So what this is asking you to do is to assess the risk of that transfer. So what the risk assessment allows you to understand and to evidence, because remember that accountability underpins the six principles of the regulation, what it's allowing you to evidence is that you um, have got a decision that says, yes, you are permitted to do the re um, restricted um, data transfer or no, you cannot. Uh, and in some cases, you may not be able to transfer the data unless you make some changes. So it's not always going to be a yes. So the ICO state, and I'm, I'm going to quote this because I think it's quite useful, that your risk assessment should not look at whether um, the laws and practices in the destination country are identical to the UK. Rather, your focus should be on whether we share certain key principles which underpin our laws. Um, and this is obviously we're thinking about security, we're talking about data minimization, we're talking about individual rights and how they are um, upheld. So this is the key aim of the um, risk assessment. And this is what you need to overall establish. And then I'm going to talk you through each of the three stages that are in the risk assessment. Well, I'd also like to point out, just in case there's anyone um, on the webinar that has already looked at the tool, the um, data transfer risk assessment that the ICO does have, it still has it in draft format, when I asked them earlier this week, well, have you finalised it? Um, their answer was not yet. So this is what we have. The, the draft format is what I'm talking about. I'm hoping it doesn't change, but if it does, uh, we may run another web webinar. But at the moment, this is the tool that you can use. Um, and like I said, it's in draft format. So there are some of the things that you need to consider. So mapping your data flow should include data not just to the importer in the country, but where do they transfer data to? So do they have any sub-processors supporting them? So you might have a cloud-based system in the US that is using Amazon Web Services, for example. So think about the uh, onward data transfers beyond the data importer, because you will be required to do a risk assessment on that entire supply chain. You will need to establish how the data importer um, will put in place the agreement and what level um, of protection they can actually um, accept. And what we do through the risk assessment is to manage and understand uh, that risk like we do with any good um, risk assessment. So what does it look like? Now, the transfer risk assessment is about a 50 page document. It's, um, it is a beast to read. I'm not going to lie. It is available on the ICO um, website to download. And what I'm going to talk through is the three steps that they talk you through for each individual transfer. So step one is to actually, not surprisingly, assess the data transfer. we need to do here is we need to be thinking about can you satisfy them this is on you to demonstrate this that you've found the answers to this can you satisfy the key requirements under the law so data minimization is um can you evidence that the data you are proposing to transfer so name email address um 
staff details, uh, business contact details, whatever it is, the data that you're intending to transfer, um, it's adequate, it's relevant, and it's limited to what that transfer relates to. So you shouldn't be transferring more data than is absolutely necessary to this third party vendor or third party uh, supplier to you. So data minimization, limited, adequate and relevant. You want to be making sure that um, you have put in place um, with the vendor um, technical and organisational measures um, to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. So this is about the type of data that you're going to transfer. So if you're going to transfer contact details, for example, you might not put as, as severe a technical um, onus on the vendor uh, to implement those controls. However, if you're going to put health data, for example, and you're going to store it on a cloud-based solution uh, in the US, what are you going to be wanting to have on that? Are you wanting that to be encrypted in transfer? Are you wanting that to be pseudonymized? So if it was to be intercepted, um, it couldn't be understood. So based on the data that you are intending to transfer, what are the security um, technical, which are the, of the encryption, the operational, which is things such as you'd want the vendor to demonstrate they've uh, got policies, procedures, and training of their staff. What do you want to see it in place? And this is what will form part of the, the contract. What are the processor obligations? So reporting a breach back to you within 24 hours. Um, do you want them to be able to be open to an, uh, you conducting um, an audit of them? Obviously, the GDPR does set out specific processor um, obligations and clauses. But what do you expect the processor to demonstrate um, to you? What's your basis for that transfer? Um, so is it consent? Is it a legitimate interest? Is it a contract? And most importantly, are you being transparent on your privacy policies that you are going to do a data transfer? So you're assessing um, the need um, for the transfer. So here are some reasons why the um, transfer risk assessment may actually not be appropriate for you uh, to conduct. And it's better to understand this early on in the process rather than spend hours upon hours on something that is not relevant. So if the transfer is not suitable, so it doesn't meet um, Article 5. So these are your um, lawful basis. This is your um, security. This is data minimization. Uh, this is retention so it doesn't meet those um, requirements you can't transfer the data um, if we like i've already said it's not suitable to do um, a, a risk assessment because actually uh, there's an adequacy decision in place that says the data can't be transferred um, you are relying on um, an exception which um, actually should say 49 not four so you have it's a one-off transfer and you've got consent or um, you have um, a contract in place to facilitate that data transfer, um, or the transfer is too complex and too high risk. So you're talking about data that involves vulnerable adults. It might be biometric um, data, um, and it's of large um, volumes, and actually it requires you to conduct a data protection impact assessment before you even consider um, the, um, the transfer. You may also want to consider if you have found a supplier or a um, vendor that happens to be in a country that has um, a very poor human rights um, record, you might not want to transfer your data there because if they don't respect individual rights and privacy, they're not likely to be able to uphold their contractual obligations um, in that regard. So, and if you're interested in, well, how do you find that information? How do you know whether or not a country has a good human rights uh, position? The Economist um, produced a report called the, um, oh my God, I can't remember what it was. It was the Economist Democracy Report of 2020. Um, if you want a link, I can send it to you. But essentially, it categorised all the different countries in no risk, low risk, medium risk and high risk. 
So if that's a, a, a link that you would want, I'm more than happy to, to send that um, to you or simply Google Econ Economist um, Democracy um, Report 2020 and it should come up. So then obviously, um, as I've um, said, the final real um, checks is for you to then determine, because you're going to have to put this actually into the agreement, is the specifics of the transfer. So who is it going to? So what kind of um, organisation is the importer? Is it a public regulator? Is it an IT company? Um, is the uh, company going to be a controller? So is it a controller to controller relationship? Is it you sending data to a processor, uh, for example? Um, who is the data about? So you would have already done this as part of your data mapping. So is it about clients? Is it about staff? Is it about business contacts? Um, what's the type of data that you're um, sending? Is it special category? So this is your health data, trade union membership, biometric, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, for example. What's the format that you're going to be transferring um, the data? So is it in plain text? Is it encrypted? Is it going to be pseudonymized? Um, how often are these transfers going to happen? So is it an everyday occurrence or is it a, a one off? Um, and how much, what's the volume of data that you are transferring? So this is all information that once you've done this assessment, you can extract and actually put into the formal data transfer um, agreement. So it is quite a key step um, at this point in, in time. So what we then have is once you've assessed um, the, the the transfer, what we're looking for is whether or not the inf information oh God, international data transfer agreement is actually enforceable uh, in the, the destination country. Now, what I am going to say is that I'm obviously providing you the guidance in terms of what this talks about. But if there are uncertainties that you have about the country you're intending to send data to and the and the agreement that you're wanting to uh, finalize and put in place you may need to seek legal counsel um, to make sure that you are in the best possible position in terms of cover so you, what you need to do is assess the enforceability of the contractual safeguards so if you're sending it to a country that has a real poor uh, human rights uh, position um, has a high level of surveillance where the government is able to ask um, companies within that country to give them access to the data. Um, it, the, the agreement that you're going to enter into may actually not be enforceable. So what you need to do is satisfy yourself as to whether or not it is enforceable. So if you're going to put contract clauses in place that both parties are going to sign up to, can both parties adhere um, to that? And like I said, um, if you're uncertain, you might want to do a bit more of a deep dive into the risk assessment. Um, you might want to consider putting in supplementary um, measures. Um, or you might simply decide that the transfer is far too risky, the agreement's not enforceable and you're not going to do the transfer or you're going to seek to transfer the data um, to a safer destination. So like I said, some of the considerations and what I like about the, the, the um, transfer agreement actually is that it's tabulated, it, it gives you what's good and what's not good. So it gives you um, an indication of what you can be looking at when we're, when we're considering about these questions. So I've only summarized it, but I, I did like the usability um, of the tool. Um, it might seem a bit overwhelming, but it does show you, like I said, good uh, and what does not good um, look like. So what you're assessing now is does the country recognise um, the, the rule of law? And most countries do. Um, can you enforce foreign judgment or arbitration? Um, is there, you know, when you look at the judicial system in that country, is there a high level of integrity? And again, I go back to that report from The Economist. It gives you really good insight in terms of the um, judicial systems within uh, countries. Um, 
and you know are there partial adequacy uh, regulations such as in Japan and Canada so therefore they do um, recognize a, a, a large amount of the UK data protection uh, laws. So if you have um, concerns that are contractual rights and protections um, you um, really should fill in section three, which is the supplementary measures that you'll find acceptable um, to put in place. And again, um, seek legal counsel to help you um, with that. So the supplementary risk assessment is to, as all risk assessments, is to assess the overall risk. So if you know what data you're transferring and you know the sensitivity of the data, you'll then be able to again go through the risks and again within the transfer risk assessment it has a nice table that sets out you know if it's staff details and it's just contacts it's a, a, a low risk a medium risk would be uh, details about the individual photos for example and then a higher risk kind of staff data is your medical information so it sets out a nice table so it allows you to assess um, the risk of that individual and that individual's data that you're planning and can you actually reduce um, the risk so one of the reductions in the risks is that you simply don't send health data or you um, will want to enforce pseudonymization um, of the data when it is uh, transferred so you should really look um, at um, the different risks you may have already done this and it might just be about revising um, those risks um, to make sure that everything has been accounted for. It's not going to be 100% perfect, but um, do, do complete this um, stage. And again, I, I will repeat it, consider whether or not there's benefit to getting legal advice, especially if you've got legal expertise that are um, that know particular countries very well and they have acted on behalf of clients in those um, countries. So some of the types of levels of measures that you want, might want to put in place, you might want to encrypt the data before it's transferred. And this might be a question you want to ask the software vendor. Do you encrypt data when it goes when I'm uploading it onto the web platform? Is it encrypted? Um, can you apply pseudonymization? So that's you stripping out the identifiable um, data uh, and making it pseudonymized. Um, can you put in additional contract clauses um, that they can adhere to? Um, so that you can um, feel a little bit more reassured that you have managed the controls uh, that you are putting um, in place. So what we're trying to determine um, at this point in time and whether or not you're able to move forward is if there is no or low risk to the harm of the data subjects, so that's your staff, your customers, um, your suppliers, then you can move to the final stage of the risk assessment. If there is an enhanced risk of harm in that maybe that country can um, have access to the data, um, use it for surveillance um, purposes, then you might need to um, reduce, well, not might, you sh should really be looking to reduce the risk by putting in the extra steps. Now, if you've decided that actually um, you've assessed the, the risk you've ever determined that the international data transfer agreement is enforceable um, in that country. Um, you might determine um, that you want to understand about third party access. And when I'm talking about third party access, we've got to be thinking about um, governments and whether or not they are going to request access to data. So one of the reasons that Privacy Shield um, failed was because of the surveillance nature and, and laws that are in place in the United States and the fact that um, certain software vendors are um, party to particular laws which entitle the government to have access um, to data. So this is what you're um, looking at. Now you might be like, I don't know the answer to this. I'm not in the best place position to, uh, to, to look at that. And again, you might want to speak to an expert um, in that country and of that laws to say you know is you know what can third parties do with my data so some of the questions you're going to be um 
uh, thinking about is, are there safeguards in relation to data sharing between public authorities? Do public authorities have wide powers to intercept communications um, and to access data? Uh, and can organisations undertake uh, workplace monitoring with no minimal safeguards? Now, you do not need to um, do this assessment and you can continue uh, beyond this stage to doing the international transfer agreement if you are satisfied that given the circumstances of the transfer, so it's minimal amount of data, uh, low risk, um, that the possibility of third party access, including surveillance, is minimal um, or third party access um, is a very low risk um, to the individual. And then other factors you may want to consider um, at this point is what rights do individuals have? So we have the right under the UK GDPR to have um, copies of our data. We have the right to have our data deleted in certain, certain, certain circumstances, if I can put my teeth in. Um, whereas if the country that you're transferring the data um, to um, individuals have no rights, they can't actually enforce them, then again, it, it will be a reason for you not to use that software vendor or transfer that data into that country. Um, and are there um, some data protection or uh, privacy laws in place, but there is little to no evidence that are effective. So they might have a data protection regime, um, but actually it's not enforceable. And then the final consideration is um, considering the specific circumstances. So if you remember, I said, what are you transferring? Why are you transferring it? What's the mechanism of the, the transfer? What's your legal basis for um, transferring the data? Um, is it only minimal amount of um, information? So assess whether the circumstances of your transfer is actually going to be of interest um, to third party countries um, such as surveillance, because if it's not, then again, you're able to, to move on um, from this um, stage. So what you're in a position now is you've done your risk assessment and at the end of the risk assessment, you've either determined that yes, you can do um, the international data transfer or it's a no. If it's a no, don't transfer the data. I just wanna make that explicitly clear. If you can, um, you have two choices um, available to you. You have the international data transfer agreement or you have the addendum to the EU standard contract clauses. And I'm going to be perfectly um, honest with you. Um, the reality is if you're already subject to the new EU standard contract clauses, the addendum is going to be the more likely scenario at, that you're going to be following. The good news about this is only nine pages. Um, it is um, relatively easy to work your way um, through. So you're unlikely to have to use the international data um, transfer agreement. You'll just use the addendum. What you'll have to do is when you're looking at the addendum is understand the type of entity that you're transferring the data to. So are you a controller transferring it to a controller? Is it a controller to a processor? processor to processor or processor to controller. These are the four modules that are set out in the European um, standard contract clauses. Um, what it also means, and it's a good thing for you, is that you're not trying to manage two um, agreements. You're just ma managing the one standard contract clause. And what you may find is a lot of your vendors are um, sending you updates to the standard contract clauses with the addendum um, to that. So like I said, it's a relatively um, short document. It's divided into two parts. Um, you should be able to pull all the information that you've done in the risk assessment in the first section where you assessed the transfer and you should be able to populate it into part one of the addendum where you're providing details of the transfer um, and the module that applies. Um, now, part two, you cannot change. These are the actual clauses um, that make the amendment work for UK transfers. So it's removed um, EU and replaced it with UK, for example. So you're modifying part one of the addendum, you're not touching part two. So um, some of the um, questions that have come up about this is, can the addendum only be used where it involves an EU 
um, chance there? Um, and the answer to that is no. So even if the EU GDPR doesn't apply, um, you've already been subject to the standard contract clauses, you can use the addendum. And that's a good thing, because it means that we're not having to create new paperwork that is unnecessary. Now, if you are not going to use the addendum to the EU standard contract clauses, you then have the UK's International Data Transfer Agreement, which is um, the UK's version of SCCs. Now, this is in four parts. Again, you can download the um, agreement from the ICO um, website. And it, it, not surprisingly, it's in four parts. You have part one, uh, which is, again, you're pulling the information that you have um, covered as part of part one of the risk assessment. So you're going to be describing what you're transferring, how you're transferring the data, um, what's its purpose of the transfer. The extra protection is where we talked about in um, part two and part three of the risk assessment is, are you expecting there to be um, supplementary measures? So do you need pseudonymization to be in place? Are you um, uh, wanting to insist on encryption? Um, what are the supplementary measures? Um, there are some commercial clauses that uh, will be introduced in terms of uh, confidentiality. And then there are the mandatory clauses that the ICO have put in there, which are, your, that are the contract clauses itself. So like I said, in most instances, once you've done your risk assessment, you are likely to be using the addendum to the EU standard contract clauses. If that's not what you want to do and you've got a new contract, you're, it's UK to a non-adequate um, country and you're going to use the International Data Transfer Agreement. Again, use the template that's on the ICO website. I would urge you to get legal counsel to review it because it is a contract that is going to be binding between you and the, and the other party. You want to make sure um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I wouldn't want to um, put something in place where I'm like, oh, uh, I'm not sure if I've got this quite right. Then the final thing really is, well, when does this all come into um, uh, effect? Sorry, I flicked a, a two slide too far ahead. So. What do you need to bear in mind are the, the following um, dates. So contracts signed after the 21st of September 2022 will need to use either the International Transfer Agreement or the addendum. So you can't be using nothing. You can't be using the old standard contract clauses uh, that were um, um, replaced last year by the EU. So 21st of September, you'll need to use either the updated addendum or the IDTA. All contracts that are signed on or before the 1st of September, which use um, the old standard contract clauses. So you're not, you've not entered into a new one. These are existing contracts. You will need to have amended or replaced versions in place by the 21st of March, 2024. Now, there is a slight conflict here in that um, the EU um, have stated that all new deals that are using the EU standard contract clauses will need to be in place by the 28th of December 2022. Now, what isn't clear yet is how the ICO are going to cope um, with that. So if you're using... Um, if you've still got the old standard contract clauses, you'll need to be moving to the new ones and then the addendum uh, on top of that. So on a positive, I would say, um, contracts that are already in existing now, that are already using EU standard contract clauses, you're most likely going to be using the addendum. If after 21st of September, you are entering into a new agreement with a new contract, you're either going to be using the EU standard contract clauses with the UK addendum or the international transfer um, agreement. So you've got a bit of time, at which point you've then got um, to the uh, 21st of March 2024 if you are on uh, uh, an existing um, agreement. So you've got a bit of time to transition. I would only say, please um, don't leave this to the last minute. Uh, I've seen that too often. Um, so I'm now going to come up to the um, 
the questions and I can see that I've already got one in the um, chat box. Now I know that was quite an intense lot of slides and a lot of information to digest. You will have the slide deck. Um, so um, in terms of um, the selected contract clauses modules and selected clauses has two options. Could you advise when we would need to use which option? So I need to um, bring that up. So what I might do is I might, if it's okay, take that question away um, because I'll need to have the deck up in front of me so I know what I'm looking at. I don't, I thought I had it in front of me, but I don't, so I do apologize. So if you're okay, I will take that question and I'll come back to you directly um with that um because i don't have it um in front of me so i do apologize um for that um are there any um other uh questions um that hopefully i can answer uh today if not i will get back to you um next week any questions any concerns that you might have Well, I can see some typing going on, so I can. There is there is quite a lot um, to to look at, um, but I am happy to um, have any questions offline uh, with people. If you not if you prefer not to have them uh, on this forum um, here, um, like I said, the recording is going to be um, available. Um, there are some um, useful law firms out there that have got some really handy tools. Um, the ones that I typically would um, look at for sure are Bird and Bird and Field Fisher. They typically have some good uh, free tools that can help you with your decision um, making. Um, OK, I will um, take the questions that I've got specifically offline and I'll come back to you because um, I think they deserve a, a, a response that gives me a bit of time to prepare for. So I will do. Um, both the two um, so the questions I'd be interested in in a response to how complete the new form uh, if you'll be sharing information on this. So um, if I would, I'd be interested in the response to how complete the new form, how to complete the new form if you will be sharing information on this. I think I, you might need to re, I'm not sure I understand the question. It might just be that <laughs> I've had a bit too much coffee. Um, today but if you could I'll take it offline actually well um, and I'll come back to you um, on that to make sure I understood the question um, anything else I feel like a how complete <laughs> so the in terms of selecting your options um, on the, the the new addendum, it really does depend on the relationship of you and the um, you as the data exporter and you as the data importer. Um, so you by selecting um, the module as is referred to in the EU standard contract clauses. So controller to controller, controller to processor will be very much um, what you'll be considering for the new um, international data transfer. Um, agreement but if you're going to go down the standard contract clauses uh, route you are looking at those kind of relationships between controller to controller controller to processor um, but I will take that online offline and I'll come back to you um, on that um, whilst if there aren't any other questions um, I've got the two that I know I've got to come back to you, um, on we do have a download um, of our catalogue. I would say keep an eye out on the ICO website. They are promising more clearer guidance um, soon. Um, I've, I've gone through what I know is available and what's on the ICO website at the moment, but they said that the transfer risk assessment is the draft version is what they're going to be using, but if anything changes, I will obviously let you know. Um, if you're interested in joining a best practice group, it's a, a, a couple of times a year where you're able to share um, information about how you adhere to data protection and any current concerns or questions that you have. Uh, it's a safe space um, and hopefully we give you some practical advice. 
you can follow us on all of our social media um, channels. Um, next month's webinar is going to be learning from data breaches and there have been some um, interesting um, fines that have been issued recently that we will be looking at and I'm going to be looking um, in particular at the law firm that was subjected to the ransomware uh, attack that got fined just under £100,000 last month so that will be one of the um, ones I look at. Um, again, I'm sorry I couldn't answer all of your questions um, today um, but I will get back to you. Anyone that has a question afterwards um, let me know, contact me um, on my email address, which you would have got as part of the invitation. Um, I hope you will get to have a fantastic day today. Enjoy the sunshine. I hope it's sunny where you are. Uh, I'm going to certainly uh, go sit out and soak up some sun rays. And uh, I will definitely be in touch with those that have asked a question. So um, thank you very much.